Do you have brain fog or otherwise lack of clarity of thought? One of the most common pieces of feedback I get from those on my protocols is increased clarity of thought in the first month. But I don't recommend probiotics nor fermented foods. In fact, there is a decent chance that both are worsening your brain fog. If you're familiar with my videos, you'll know that I am not a fan of probiotics nor of fermented foods in those who are dysbiotic. I provide plenty of evidence as to why my approach is more intelligent. And I will provide even more new data here in this video trying to show you the science and not sell you on the hype. If you saw my video entitled SIBO, Stop Going in Therapeutic Circles, this slide may look familiar. Other than this one slide, all the following papers are new to my channel. Here, subjects with and without brain fog and SIBO were studied. SIBO was significantly more prevalent in brain fog than not, 68% versus 28%. And get this, all brain fog subjects consumed probiotics, and 37% consumed yogurt. After discontinuation of probiotics and yogurt, and a course of antibiotics, a temporary solution, 85% of the patients reported complete resolution of brain fog. So now I'm going to do something a little different. I'm going to take seven quotes from this very paper and one quote from a reply and highlight the references from which they originate. In the end, you can decide if your probiotics and or fermented foods are hurting your brain fog or for that matter, anything else. Quote number one. Previously, similar symptoms, along with slurred speech and gait disturbances, have been described in patients with short bowel syndrome. References two and three. These patients were found to have metabolic acidosis with elevated levels of D-lactic acid in the serum. Odds are you don't have short bowel syndrome, which is simply put when part of the small intestine is missing due to genes, damage, or surgery. So this could also apply to Crohn's disease patients who had surgery. But in short bowel syndrome, excess carbs may not be properly absorbed and thus ferment in the lower gastrointestinal tract, causing an increase in D-lactic acid. This table highlights the neurological symptoms that high brain levels of D-lactic acid can yield. Some may look familiar to you. So here we are able to tie in brain fog and other neurological symptoms to the bacterial fermentation in the gut. Quote number two. Recently, probiotic use has been implicated in the production of D-lactic acidosis, both in short bowel syndrome patients and in the first two weeks of life in infants who were fed probiotic-containing formula. References six and seven. From these papers, the text to the left highlights concerns about D-lactate production within lactobacillus and its overgrowth. And to the right, we have content referencing how the brain does not possess the enzyme necessary to process D-lactate, resulting in accumulation and toxicity when serum levels are elevated. Quote number three. Typically, D-lactic acidosis is caused by the fermentation of ingested carbohydrate by D-lactic producing bacteria such as lactobacillus and bifidobacterium in the bowel. References two and three. It is true that bifidobacterium produces D-lactate. However, lactobacillus does so more prolifically. In addition, it appears that lactobacillus can function very well in a wide range of pH, where bifidobacterium and others cannot. More on that shortly. In addition, lactobacillus can colonize the small intestine, especially in the presence of slowed motility. This refers back to SIBO and the study which got us started on this path. And from this text, several points are made, one being how many species of lactobacillus can convert the harmless L-lactate to D-lactate, and how they blamed both probiotics and antibiotics for lactic acidosis in two case studies. Two themes, probiotics and antibiotics, I mention all of the time. Just a brief pause here in the presentation. If you could just hit like and subscribe, it would really help this channel out. Quote number four. In a preliminary report, we described seven patients who presented with both unexplained abdominal bloating and brain fog and who were consuming probiotics. Reference eight. These cases are not with short bowel syndrome subjects. 
These were regular patients in a motility center investigated to determine whether brain fogginess, gas, and bloating are due to D-lactic acidosis and SIBO. From this excerpt, they talk about how the so-called probiotics from supplements and fermented foods can colonize the small intestine, driving fermentation of which one end product can be D-lactate, which they blamed for the neurological symptoms. They also mention how lactobacillus tends to be resistant to antibiotics, and they are not the only ones saying this. Quote number five. D-lactic acidosis was first described in 1979 in a patient with short bowel syndrome who presented with unexplained anion gap metabolic acidosis and episodes of severe neuropsychological symptoms. Reference two. This whole D-lactic acidosis thing has been known for decades in humans and in animals for even longer. Here is the first publication on it. And even then, the probiotic Lactobacillus acidophilus was highly suspected as being the cause. Quote number six. Unlike L-lactate that is efficiently metabolized, the breakdown of D-lactate via the methylglyoxal pathway is slow and limited and can be confounded by comorbid conditions causing significant accumulation and acidosis. References three and 20. In the healthy, D-lactate is metabolized without problem. In fact, in the healthy microbiome, the production and absorption of D-lactate is significantly less as it's controlled. So there is even less for the kidney and liver to cope with in the healthy. But these quotes highlight that metabolism can be compromised in the unhealthy. To the left, we see a quote about impaired renal function which is sadly compromised in many conditions slash diseases and is highly associated with an unhealthy microbiome, as you will soon see in my video on chronic kidney disease and the microbiome. To the right, we see how oxalates are potent inhibitors of the enzyme which metabolizes D-lactate. Now, having worked with many people from all around the world, I can tell you that a fair number tell me that they have big problems with dietary oxalates. So imagine having symptoms driven by the overlap of oxalates and D-lactate. For example, three common symptoms of oxalate intolerance, mood changes, dizziness, and difficulty focusing are all neurological in nature and sound like symptoms from D-lactate acidosis. Quote number seven. In short bowel syndrome, if the colon is colonized by D-lactate-producing bacteria, the delivery of large amounts of unabsorbed carbohydrate causes rapid fermentation, gaseous distension, and production of large amounts of D-lactic acid overwhelming hepatic clearance, reference 20, and causing D-lactic acidosis and encephalopathy. But you can also have lactate accumulation in those without short bowel syndrome, like an ulcerative colitis. But honestly, in my many meta-analyses, I often highlight the vast majority of the time the microbiomes of those with any given condition slash disease have significantly more lactobacillus than the healthy controls. And from this paper, we get a couple important points, which you should take the time to read. They talk about a cycle of lactate production and declining pH. I highly recommend you watch my video on pH where I talk about exactly these things. The bottom line here is that lactobacillus can drive the colonic pH outside the Goldilocks zone, which favors it and a high lactate cycle, but does not favor the true health promoters. And now for our last quote. In another report, D-lactic acidosis was provoked twice by probiotics. These authors also go on to discuss lactic acid driving down colonic pH and how antibiotics select out resistant lactobacillus. In fact, in my video on antibiotics, I show repeatedly how lactobacillus is increased after antibiotics use. And do you know who's decreased? The true health promoters some of whom can use lactate to make butyrate. Also, their quote here talks about the mechanism by which D-lactate drives neurotoxicity. In conclusion, D-lactate and lactate accumulation are relevant in brain fog and other neurological symptoms, SIBO, 
jejunal ileal bypass surgery, Crohn's surgery, short bowel syndrome, and ulcerative colitis, just to name the conditions with the most data. Lactobacillus can ferment in both the small and large intestine, causing a series of problems. Lactobacillus is significantly higher in the microbiomes of just about every condition you can think of. Two enormous risk factors for dysbiosis-driven disease, antibiotics and PPIs, both consistently increase lactobacillus abundance in the microbiome. And at times, lactobacillus can be outright pathogenic. See my video entitled, Lactobacillus Probiotics, a dumb idea in those who are dysbiotic. So, if you have brain fog, i.e. an inability to focus, and in all likelihood you have some other condition tied to gut symptoms, then why would you want to add probiotics or fermented foods into an already high lactate environment? None of what I previously covered is true for the pH, oxygen, and antibiotic-sensitive butyrate-producing health promoters of the microbiome. It is here where you should be focused on returning your mental acuity. This is why I have so many people reporting back to me with improvements in mood and focus. If what you've been doing hasn't been working, then it's time to try something more intelligent. Well, I hope you enjoyed that video. And I will say that uh, basically every single day on my YouTube comments and in emails, I get a lot of thanks from people out there who really appreciate the information I've been sharing. And so part of that is you're welcome. The other part is you can contribute by uh, doing clicking on the super thanks below. And if you're not uh, doing a consultation with me and you're not purchasing any protocols, it's a great way to support this channel. Uh, each presentation, depending on you know, the presentation, uh, but most of them take an incredible amount of time to put together. There's a lot of material. There's a lot of data checking. And so it's just, it's just you know, sometimes 50, 60, 70 hours to put together one presentation. And so if you can just click that super thanks, I'd appreciate that, and we'll keep the information coming.